Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast for 24 more hours. Well, graduation is in May, but uh, for 24 more hours, Lindsay Tillo is a fourth-year pharmacy student at the University of Iowa. She's had experience working at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics as an inpatient pharmacy technician, as well as CVS Pharmacy and Target. But she's ultimately decided working directly with patients in a community setting is her passion. She starts her pharmacy career in Charlotte, North Carolina at CVS Pharmacy Inside Target, where she hopes to eventually provide clinical services to patients in need. Lindsay, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, we're going to start with the leadership road. Everyone's leadership road is a little bit different. Tell me a little bit about where uh, pharmacy came into your life, how you decided to go to the University of Iowa, uh, and then uh, tell us a little bit about your plans for the future. Yeah, so um, I've always been interested in um, healthcare and the healthcare setting. Um, my aunt's a pharmacist, so I shadowed her and decided that that was the route that I wanted to take. Um, I decided that maybe working with patients and getting nitty gritty with blood and guts was not my thing. Um, so I decided to go to the University of Iowa and pursue a career in pharmacy. Um, and it ultimately worked out for me. Um, I, like you said, I started working at the University of Iowa Hospital, and that's kind of where I got my foot in the door with the pharmacy. Um, it was a great experience because I met so many great pharmacists who taught me all sorts of things about pharmacy and about life, and it was a great experience. Um, but then I started pharmacy school and had a rotation at Target Pharmacy. I thought, oh, this is going to be awful. I don't know if I'm going to like retail. I don't want to do this. But it ended up being the best thing ever because um, I will never forget, I had a patient who was complaining of muscle cramps. And I thought, oh, I thought everybody just knew that when you had muscle cramps, it was because you needed electrolytes like magnesium. And so realizing that not everybody knows those little things was what made me decide that community is where I was needed. Um, So then I ended up getting a job in uh, Target Pharmacy. And um, I, I don't know, I just loved it and continued to work there even when we became CVS Pharmacy. And Um, We'll continue to work there when I graduate in a month, like you said. Um, But I will be moving to Charlotte, which I'm very excited about. Okay, well, tell us a little bit about that curse of knowledge. You started off uh, when you, you know, started off college, uh, knew very little about uh, maybe some of the medications and the disease states. But now you're at the point where you have to actually take a step back and say, oh, my gosh. I, I know all this, and that's just kind of ingrained in me. Um, how do you take it to uh, a patient and get that one-on-one so that you meet them uh, where they are, especially with something as simple as electrolytes? Yeah, so it's kind of funny you asked me about that because I will talk to my family, and um, my mom will be like, dumb it down for me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then I'll talk to my aunt, and she'll be like on the same page with me, just totally green. So <laughs> I totally get what you're saying and where you're coming from. Um, but yeah, I just have to take a step back and think about, okay, where was I you know, four years ago when I didn't know you know, all that I know now about medications and pharmacy. Um, and I like to think about it like every patient is my family, like my mom or my sister. And so I like to treat them, um, you know, just like that and realize that they, um, they don't know all these things that I know and they have other, um, talents and knowledge that I don't. So I need to share my knowledge with them, but maybe on, um, more of a, you know, a a lower level. So that way they get that, okay, electrolytes is just Gatorade or, you know, something like that. So they kind of can compare the two to every, everyday life. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about community pharmacy. I was community pharmacist for a long time. 
I honestly don't feel I should ever be allowed in a hospital unless I go back to pharmacy school and, and do that <laughs> stuff. I think that I focus maybe too much on that way. But uh, right now, it's actually tough to be a community pharmacist because so much of the pressure says you have to do a residency and you have to go to hospital. And if you're if you're not in the community, you're not working at the top of your license. But it sounds like, and we'll talk about this in the way that you, you worked with the students one-on-one, it sounds like one-on-one is your best spot. Can you talk about how you get good at working one-on-one with patients and people? Yeah, so like I said earlier, um, I just really like to think about each patient, like my best friend, my mom, my family, um, and how would I want somebody to talk to them about their health and their medications? Um, because like we, we just said, they don't, they don't always know what's going on, and they go to the doctor, and they're given this new diagnosis and new medications, and they're overwhelmed and confused and maybe a little sad or frustrated with their life. And so then I like to take a step back and just be their friend, but also be there to provide any information that I can just to help them get through it. Um, and obviously, since the patients come to the pharmacy you know, once a month, it's a little bit easier to have that long-term conversation with them versus a physician or a pharmacist in the hospital who only sees them when they come in for a visit or are admitted to the hospital. Um, So it's easier, I think, in the community to just sit down with them and take the time to say, okay, this is what your disease state is, and this is what you can do at home to kind of help that, Um, you know, maybe your diet or exercise, or um, maybe if you just find a friend who has the same diagnosis, you guys can get together and talk about it, and maybe things will be a little bit better. Um, But I like to just encourage them to come to me with any questions, too. I feel like if you have that relationship with your patients where they feel comfortable with you, you'll ultimately get through to them. When I first started, uh, the first thing that we asked a patient would be, are you dropping off or picking up? And it seems like you've learned in school or the new wave, and we're talking about 20 years later, 24 years later from when I started, uh, that things are much different. So how do you in not only engage a patient, but how do you keep yourself from being transactional? And when a patient comes in saying, okay, what's your last name? Or, uh, you know, what, who are you picking up for? Yeah, so I like to approach every patient as, how can I help you? What can I do to help your day um, be a little bit better? Because you're right, not everybody's coming in to pick up or drop off a prescription. Some people just have a question about, where's the baby aspirin? Um, And so if you take... Oh, chewable aspirin, low dose <laughs> aspirin. Well, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, there was. My parents loved me. I know they did, but they gave me Orange St. Joseph's baby aspirin. Oh, because, no. <laughs> because that that wasn't a thing in the early seventies. So it's just, I, and I know we still call it that. But yeah, that's uh, that's funny you mention it. I didn't mean to derail your <laughs> your train of thought. But but how do you um how do you let those patients know you care? Yeah. So um. I know in school we're taught to, and a lot of it was at the community pharmacy um, practice site, but you're taught, okay, if a patient has a question, whether it's about their medication or they just want to find a product, you go out to the aisle with them and you help them and you ask them open-ended questions. So if somebody's asking for their low-dose aspirin, um, (laughs) you can just say, oh, you know, what are you planning on taking this for or um, things like that. And then if If they say, well, I really don't know why I'm supposed to take this, then you can kind of get into that conversation about, okay, well, this could be your disease state, and maybe doing this would also help you. And um, then they kind of feel like, oh, wow, this person really cared about me, and they really care about my health. Um, So just, just starting that conversation instead of just, okay, how, you know, are you here to pick up or whatever, you know? It's sure, sure. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'm. I'm from the East Coast, and my wife has said over and over again how it's not that the people on the East Coast are mean. It's just they're not as nice or they're just not <laughs> as, as, you know, so forward. And, and I, you know, I've learned to wave to people I don't know. I've learned to lift the <laughs> second finger off of my hand, off the steering wheel to say hello to people <laughs> I'm passing. Uh, but tell me a little bit about how the curriculum at Iowa gets you prepared to talk one-on-one with people and to uh, help them out. Uh, with the students, I'm embarrassed to say this, but many times the students would say, yeah, I'd, I'd rather talk to Lindsay uh, than talk to me. <laughs> and that's both 
hurtful and wonderful at the same time for you. Uh, but tell me, how did the curriculum or what are the classes or what are the professors that really allowed you to make it so that you're extremely welcoming? Yeah, so I think a big part of that was um, our lab. Our PPL is what it's called. Um, we did a lot of mock interviews, and we had um, you know actors come in and even interview them. And I think preparing for that, I would work with uh, um, the professors and with my friends, and we would just kind of think about, okay, how would I want to be treated in the pharmacy or when I go to the doctor's office? And how can I relay that um, you know, in this interview with this pretend patient and really make it as real as possible? And I think the, um, the University of Iowa did a really good job of of making it feel real, like you were really in a pharmacy. And I think a big part of that, too, also came from working at um, the Coralville Target. My pharmacy manager, Chris Nevy, she really told me that you need to make it a conversation with the patient instead of just, these are the side effects, here's your medication. You need to make it open-ended. You need to have them respond to you as well as you giving them information. And I think she was really the one that shaped me um, to, to be more welcoming towards individual patients like that. Uh, so we're close to uh, the end of, you know, a lot of people are looking for jobs. Uh, some people, unfortunately, didn't match. Uh, the chances of matching in match two are not the best. And then in the scramble, it's about 5%. So tell me, how did you get a job in what is sometimes a difficult job market? Well, um, honestly, I have always known that I've wanted to go to North Carolina. It's just something that has been on my mind for a really long time. So I got in contact with my district manager uh, for Target, CVS Pharmacy Inside Target, and um, just said, hey, this is what I want. And would you have any contact information for somebody there? And he gave me an email address for the district manager of Charlotte. And so I just emailed him my resume and said, you know, I'm interested in a position. And when I graduate, is there any possibility of that? And it just went from there. I when, got lucky. When did that happen, though? When, when, when did you send out uh, your resume? So I might have done that a little too early. I did it, <laughs> like, back in August and September. Um, but... It works for me. I'm just a little bit, um, I like to be prepared. <laughs> well, if you know, you know, you know, okay. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about teaching. Um, so I've, I've learned, uh, it's my first time taking APPE students, or my first year taking APPE students. I had J-term students for a long time, and, and I wasn't sure if I had enough uh, to give them, but I, I felt comfortable this year doing it. And what I've done is in the first 48 hours, you're live teaching with someone. And I thought, that's great, but maybe I could have done that a little better. So tell us a little bit about the uh, experience you had teaching the first time and what maybe as a preceptor I could have done a little bit differently to let the other preceptors out there know that, hey, your student might not give you feedback, but I'm certainly willing to take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um my situation was a little unique because I chose this rotation for many reasons, but one of the biggest reasons I chose it is because um, I get a little nervous speaking in front of large groups, and so I figured, okay, I have to do it. I might as well just jump in and get as much practice and as much feedback as possible. Um, so that is why I chose this rotation. So when you told me I was going to be lecturing in front of 60 students, I just got butterflies in my stomach. I was so nervous. Um, but ultimately, I knew, okay, these students were once in the position I, or they are in the position I was once in. And how did those professors that I had, um, what did I like that they did? And what can I do to kind of make it more comfortable for these students and really help them learn and um, just kind of sucked up my nerves. And <laughs> I, I know you told me that uh, I speak a little bit too fast, and I don't think that's something that'll ever change. <laughs> but um... there are some strategies that we've, <laughs> we've talked about, which is writing on the board so it slows you down, and, and or writing in the answers so it slows you down. Because I'm also a fast talker, but I, I think that their students are pretty forgiving. Uh, if the next time you come back and you crush it, but you also uh, started making sheets that would help them. So tell me a little bit about how things really 
became concrete as, okay, so I was giving them the information the first time, but then the second time around, you had at least 25 questions for uh, the whole, for the lecture. So tell me a little bit about your, your change in mindset and your preparation. Cause it wasn't just, okay, I've got to really know this stuff. You knew the stuff. That wasn't the issue. It was, how do I make it like I would want it to be? Yeah, so um, I remember I had a professor, Dr. Swigel, who he would create handouts instead of PowerPoints, and I really liked that process. So I decided to go ahead and recreate that process and have a handout instead of a PowerPoint for these students. And I made a, what, nine, eight or nine page uh, handout the first day, <laughs> and you're like, there's no way you're going to get through this in 90 minutes. <laughs> But I did, and I did it in like an hour. <laughs> so after that, I decided, okay, I've got to do something to engage the students a little bit better and to slow myself down. And I figured, okay, what's the best way to do that but ask questions to lead into the next um, thought and the next idea. And so I just started coming up with these questions based on um, the material I was giving them and thought, okay, this is a great way for them to, to really learn and become engaged in the, in the class. Okay, let's talk about some of the specific uh, tips. Maybe we can give another student who might be going on an academic rotation or something like that. Tell me how you pause to wait for someone to answer because how do you deal with that silence when you ask a question and nobody immediately responds? That was the worst. Um, <laughs> it um, went away. It for... did, but it was the worst. I. <laughs> Our pharmacy class is known as the quiet class because literally no one will answer. Oh. <laughs> and so when the professors all say, oh, you are the quiet class, now I get it. I get their pain that they went through. Um, I'm on, I can be impatient sometimes. So when I ask a question, I was expecting an immediate response. And then I remembered, okay, I didn't like to answer questions because I was... Um, a little nervous about being wrong and I was nervous about being put on the spot. So then I just remembered, okay, I need to take a step back and let these students think about the question for a second. Let them really like, you know, think about it and look up the answer if they need to. And then eventually somebody will answer because they'll be so uncomfortable as well. Yeah. The, the book says 43 seconds is how long you're supposed to wait. And that, that seems like an eternity. And and you, you really, as a student, you get knocked if you do answer or you don't answer. So if you do answer and get it right, people are like, oh, show off. <laughs> and if you do answer and get it wrong, then you've got the judgment of you getting it wrong. So there's no win really for the student except when it becomes so uncomfortable, the quiet, like, I'm just going to answer because I just can't handle this quiet. <laughs> so that's, that's tough. And, and you've handled that well. Well, let's talk about your, your also your bread and butter, which is students love you one on one. They uh, love to have you there, have you next to them. Um, tell me a little bit about how you've worked with students one on one. Yeah, so I had a lot of students, um, especially in your chemistry class, that would come up to me for questions on their homework problem. And um, I remember thinking, I haven't done chemistry for like six years. I don't know if I'm going to know how to answer these questions, but uh, it all came back to me in an instant. So I was thankful for that. But um, I just, when I was in college, I, I obviously went to the University of Iowa. And so I had a big class and you didn't get that one-on-one uh, -on -one work unless you went and asked for help. And so I didn't always go and ask for help. Um, but when I did, I, the TA wouldn't always be much help for me because they would be speaking over my head. So it kind of goes back to talking to the patients about, um, you know, on their level. And so I would talk to the students on their level and try to just, okay, I need to go back to the very first step and why am I doing this? And how can I explain this in a way that's going to make sense to them so that way they can replicate the same problem for the exam? Yeah, and, and I, I have people, I have students teach uh, chemistry and pharmacology and it's what students have said is it's nice to have something that you can if you need to you know refresh or pick up again but you know maybe in a second round critical care rotation where you're there for 12 to 14 hours you never get that feeling of I got it I've got it down <laughs> <laughs> but with these students uh, and and you know you you had that you know you say five or six years ago and then you had you know pharmaceutical chem and all those things uh, I feel like um, tell me a little bit about how 
being able to be an expert on something improves your confidence and maybe not just in the classroom, but your confidence as you go out and become a pharmacist? Yeah. So um, I like to think about this as if I prepare for a class, I'm going to know what I want to say and what I want to do. And then I'm going to come off as confident and the students are going to really truly believe what I'm saying. Um, And the same thing goes for pharmacy practice. So if I tell a patient, oh, you know, you shouldn't give your your child aspirin, but I'm like, oh, maybe you shouldn't give it to them. They probably aren't going to believe me and they're going to think that I don't know what I'm talking about. So if you just really make sure you look up or you know what the answers are and you come across confident, um, you know, everybody's going to believe you. Although, with that being said, you also, especially in the healthcare profession, need to know when you don't know something. So if you aren't 100% confident, you need to say, "Mm, I'm not sure, let me look that one up for you. Yeah, no, those are the three toughest words as a healthcare professional to say, I don't know, uh, and and I'll have to look up for you. Well, um, one other thing I wanted to go over, so you're you're going to Charlotte and, you know, you said you wanted to do this for a long time. Um, tell me a little bit about what you're hoping for in the future. Uh, you did get to talk to someone who is working in Charlotte now. Uh, tell me a little bit about what your future looks like. Well, I'm really excited to go to Charlotte for several reasons. Obviously, the weather and the environment is kind of what drew me there. (laughs) But um, I also really like how progressive they are with pharmacy practices. So um, pharmacists can become providers in the state of North Carolina. And I really like the idea of of doing that to help provide patients with clinical services. Um, You know, so maybe monitoring their uh, blood sugars and helping them adjust their doses of insulin if they need it or their hypertension medications. Um, I just like being able to do little things like that. Um, And I feel like then the patient really truly appreciates your help because they don't have to make an extra doctor's appointment or they don't need to, um, you know, worry about, oh no, I haven't had a doctor's appointment for a year. I can't get a refill. Um, So being able to provide those services could be a huge step for pharmacists. And I really want to be a part of that. So I'm really excited to learn how to um, how to really change the pharmacy practice, and I feel like North Carolina is a good place to do that. Wow! So I uh, this is the other Iowa school, uh, Drake, uh, where Anna Shields picked you uh, picked her residency because of the state's laws, and I've heard that that's more common where you feel like you're going to learn more because the state allows you to do more. And so when you say top of your license, I didn't think about that until just now that that means something completely different in two different states. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other things I'm guessing that you've already started looking at the pharmacy law (laughs) because you knew where you were going. Tell me a little bit more about uh, picking a state based on those kinds of things, the, the ability to do more things than you would at another Yeah, so I think it's important to, you know, before you decide where you want to end up, especially right out of school, you need to consider those pharmacy laws because if they're doing something that you're not interested in or you don't want to do, then that's probably not a good place for you to go. Um, I think what really actually helped me, and this was kind of after I got the job and everything, but I I talked to um, Jessica in North Carolina for your podcast, and she gave me a lot of really good information and a lot of good advice. Um, So I think reaching out and trying to find somebody who's in a similar position that you're in um, is a really great way to learn more about the state and see if whether you think it's a good match or not for you. And obviously always going to shadow the pharmacy or talking to the district manager about the differences from state to state might be a good idea as well. Well, I've asked you a lot of questions. Do you have anything else you want to say here the day before you're done with pharmacy school? Especially to those people behind you, (laughs) in the classes behind you. Uh, I guess what I do want to say to especially those P3s out there (laughs) is I remember my first day as a P4 student on rotation, and I remember thinking, I do not know anything. (laughs) I'm going to fail. This is going to be awful. But I, you know, when I was asked those tough questions, it all came flooding back to me, and I, I knew what I was doing. So just be confident, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Well, thanks not only for being on the Pharmacy Podcast, but thanks for helping uh, the students uh, that you have helped over this last semester. Thanks, Tony. 
Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag hash pharmacy leaders 